We're so grateful to have so many assembled here at Chesapeake College today on a rainy day. My name is Eric Johnson. I have the honor of serving as the chairperson for the Queen Anne's County Council for Children and Youth. And my co-chair right here on the other end of the room is Elizabeth Miller, who works for the Queen Anne's County Public School System in the Judy Center. So we would like to start with some welcoming remarks today. Um, so I would like to invite Dr. Clifford Coppersmith, president of Chesapeake College, to uh, join me. Thanks, Eric. Well, uh, welcome to Chesapeake, and I have to do this. How many of you are alums? That's awesome. Well, we're happy to have you on campus today. Uh, Chesapeake College is a wonderful institution. I'm now completing my fourth year here. And um, as uh, many of you all, all know, and, and you've been in the same world, the last four years have been very interesting. I'll just put it that way. Uh, but we are uh, so happy to partnership with uh, the county school district. Uh, I've worked with Patty Salins ever since I got here, and it's great to, to have her on campus today. Um, we welcome you for what is uh, you know, just a very important topic. Uh, obviously, as a college, we deal with mental health with our students uh, every day. Um, and uh, we actually have a great partnership with Four All Seasons, and I think I saw our person walk in just a few minutes ago that we work very closely with. Where is she? There she, she was, I thought. Oh, she's up front, Beth Ann, okay. So uh, we just, uh, it, the bad news is the services are needed. The good news is we have them available. We have uh, counseling both on campus and online, and um, from what I understand, our services are fully subscribed to, which is, uh, that's good. Uh, but uh, as I always like to say, it's, it's, it's also an indicator of the challenges our, our students face. Uh, I've been associated with higher education now for almost 30 years, and even before COVID, I think the number was about 40% nationally as college students were in some level of care for mental health issues, whether it was learning disabilities or depression or anxiety being the primary categories. So with COVID, it's, it's much higher. Um, I don't know what the most recent statistic is, but I'm guessing it could be up to 60% now, students either requiring services, having services, or needing them. Um, so it's a huge challenge, it's a crisis. Uh, we know suicides are a real challenge uh, for our young people. Uh, the issue with uh, fentanyl uh, overdoses in particular, very alarming. So we know that the need is great for uh, counseling, for information, for all the things that all of you are involved with. So we're very uh, grateful to, to host this activity. We're willing to do this anytime. So we're, we're grateful for your presence on campus today. Uh, Chesapeake's doing all right. Uh, we're recovering our enrollment. Uh, we have a nice trend coming back for fall. We're not even close to where we were before COVID, but we're getting there. We have a lot of uh, great financial resources. We're very grateful for our county, and I know Chris is here somewhere. Thank you very much. And also the state. We had a historic allocation uh, this year that finally meets the Cade formula, which is the formula under which the community colleges are funded as a percentage of the University of Maryland. First time since the 1990s that we've been fully funded for that formula. So we're very grateful for that because we all we all need that to get us back to uh, where we need to be with our student enrollment in particular, which took a, a real beating over the last two years. Uh, our students are roughly, this semester as we're completing, we have commencement tomorrow. We are planning for a good old fashioned in the TPAC commencement. We'll be about half occupancy. We have about 120 students graduating tomorrow. And uh, we're just really grateful to be back on campus. I think our contribution to normalcy is providing the resources for students to be back on campus as much as possible. This semester, we have about 60% of our students online, about 40% on campus. We want to get that number uh, a little higher. We're hoping in the fall to be closer to 45, or I'm sorry, 50% on campus. Because even though students like online, it's not necessarily good for them for all kinds of reasons. For many students, there are additional learning challenges in the online environment. There's always issues with technology. We have a large number of students who are dual enrolled right now. In fact, for fall, the last statistic, we have 49% of our students enrolled for fall are dual enrollment students. That's <laughs> spectacular. Uh, before COVID, we were about 25%. This year, we've been about 25%. So those are high school students taking college classes. And uh, we love the preferences to have them taking those college classes in their high schools with their high school instructors who are qualified to teach the college level. The next best preference is for our faculty to be doing it and obviously a lot of them are doing it online. But uh, students are better prepared for the online environment, I think, 
because of what's happened in the last couple of years, but still many students are better served by good old fashioned on campus, in classroom with an instructor, and that's where we hope to be doing more of our business in the coming year. So we're doing everything we can to have a normal experience for students, whether they're online or on campus. We have all our services available online, including financial aid counseling, academic advising, all those kinds of things, office hours by faculty, and we're doing everything we can to get students back to normal. But we know that what's coming in the next several years, I've heard this mostly anecdotally from my faculty who have young children at home, we know that we are going to be facing many of the challenges that you are already facing as you uh, deal with young people, either in services or in our public education system. So we're looking forward to hearing all the great ideas and suggestions and recommendations that come out of today's work. I wish you all the best. Uh, you are definitely doing the work of God with uh, what you're doing with our young people. And uh, the needs are so great and the challenges are so great. But the good story is there's lots of help. And whatever we can do to be assistance there, we, we hope to be there for you. So welcome to Chesapeake. Don't forget your lunch. And uh, have a great afternoon and stay dry. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Coppersmith. And uh, Dr. Coppersmith mentioned something that I think is important to highlight, and that was the idea that our children have been more prepared for virtual learning as a result of things that happened during the pandemic. And the reason I highlight that, we, we understand that. Those of us that are parents absolutely do. But it also points to one of the things we want to make sure we're doing today, and that is we're not here to just talk about problems. And when we talk about the mental health state of the child, we're looking at the whole child. We're looking at the positive things that are happening, the strengths that come out of chaos and crisis. So I think you'll see as we do our needs assessment and as our speakers talk today that we want to be even-handed in how we approach things. I also want to just thank uh, Chesapeake College for being just an exceptional partner. If you have not had an opportunity to have an event with the college or partner with them on something, I highly encourage it. Michelle Hall has been phenomenal. Dr. Coppersmith, Kevin Brown, just a wonderful uh, set of folks to work with. So thank you, sir, very much. Um, I'd like to invite the president of our county commissioners, Chris Corcorino, to come forward to also provide welcoming remarks. Good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you all for coming out, um, all the different agencies that have partnered to make this event happen. Uh, it's very important for our children. The county commissioners, I'm, I'm here representing them to thank all of you for coming. And Eric, everybody who organized this, appreciate you guys doing this. Um, I'm not only president of the county commissioners, but I am the father of three daughters who are in this county growing up. And uh, during COVID, there have been many great things to see the resiliency of children and how they respond to things. Um, but there's been troubles as well, right? And I guess it was a few days after Christmas, I was with my family in North Carolina. It was a beautiful day and we're hiking a mountain and we get a call that one of my daughter's uh, classmates had committed suicide. And to have to tell them about that, it was difficult. And to see their reaction to that, sorry, I still get a little choked up about it. And I had a hard time understanding how could life be so heavy for a kid who's in eighth grade. And so I took the time to reach out to other people in the community and organizations. Um, Dr. Salins and I had a lot of conversations about what more can we do for our children, you know, to help them, give them those resources. We were all barreling through COVID as adults trying to balance teaching kids and working from home in the remote. And, and I think some of us, we forgot what the kids were going through. We have the benefit of perspective in life. We've seen challenges and we've overcome them. We know as bad as today is, there are better days ahead. The kids don't have that, right? They, they live in that moment. And then sometimes that moment could be so overwhelming for them. Um, so I think it's important that we get this together in the partnerships that we're talking to the community and, and letting parents know um, it's okay if their kids are having a bad day. You know, they don't have to cheer them up all the time, right? We have bad days, that's normal. Um, but talk to them, make sure the kids have somebody that they're talking to and even if it's not the parent that they have friends that they're talking to. Um, and that we are reducing any stigma that might be associated with mental health. Um, obviously, suicide's at one end of the spectrum. We have substance abuse and, and all in between. Um, 
and we have to treat that all and let kids know, look, if, if you're having troubles, there are resources that are there for you. And we need to make sure the parents know what resources are there. And that's why these events are really important, that everybody gets together and, and talks about these issues, about how do we help the kids and, and how can we partner. Um, as far as the county commissioners go, each one of you can reach out to me anytime if you think there's something more that the county can be doing to help, and I'm always an open ear. Um, I think Mike Clark will tell you, I go out of my way to try to do good in the county, try to help people out. Um, it's really important to me that not just my kids, but their friends and all the other kids in the county are growing up and being resilient um, and that they have the resources that they need. So thank you all for everything that you're doing here. Um, and I guess Dr. Salins will be our next speaker. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Chris uh, Corcoran, our commissioner. Um, and thank you for the poignant example that you shared. And so that's a good segue into just prior to introducing our keynote speaker, just to illustrate why we're here. I feel like this is a group that can be brutally honest and uh, transparent with one another. I'm gonna invite you all to raise your hand in a moment, if you will, you don't have to, but if you feel so inclined, raise your hand if someone in your immediate or extended family is struggling with emerging mental health issues, in part driven by this pandemic, or worsening issues through the pandemic and beyond. Would you all be willing to? Okay, so it's virtually everybody here. I, th I think that says plenty. Um, I also want to just note before moving on um, just how wonderful the commissioners have been to us. If you did not know, the Queen Anne's County Council for Children and Youth is in its 51st year of operation this year. And we've had the support from our commissioners for all 51 of those years, so thank you, sir. So without further ado, wonderful speaker. If you have not heard Patty Salen speak, you're about to. Um, we are so grateful for all the work that she and her team does. And so without further ado, please welcome Patty Salens, Dr. Salens. Thank you so much. And thank you for this opportunity to be here um, for such an important topic. And no better to start today um, with our game plan of what we need to do to get through this crisis. And thank you again to the council for everything they've done to set this up today, to give us this opportunity to be here. Um, it, it truly is something that is um, needed in our community as we've just heard um, from Chris. Um, and that's not the isolated case of, of our community, unfortunately. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit today about um, our why. Why do we think this is happening? I want to talk about the compounding factors that maybe have forced this issue to a crisis. I want to talk specifically about Queen Anne's County. I know not everyone here probably is from Queen Anne's County, but specifically about our schools, where we've come um, as it relates to COVID, and really what our next steps are. Um, so that's what I'd like to review today. So I want to start back with something from the beginning of time um, as primal as we are from our, that humans are social beings. We are, we, we actually thrive on it, we live by it, and if we don't have it, then it, then it hurts our well-being, our, our mental health. And so isolation um, can do some pretty big damage to people. And um, we, we, we socially reach out in every type of form to be social beings. We are programmed that way. Um, we're programmed to share our feelings and our thoughts and to create emotion around us. And that's really important to understand as we look at the platform for social media. So I know that we can all understand that social media is very popular. <laughs> and it's very popular because we're social beings and we like to interact with each other. And when we can't be face to face, then that gives us an opportunity to still make those connections. So, Take it all the way back to 1844. That was the first time that there was actually social interaction that wasn't face to face. That was your first um, social media right there. Taps, dots, dashes. I'm not an expert at it, but I can tell you that it worked. And believe it or not, they had messages similar to what we did. I mean, today I know we use OMG, oh my God, or LOL, laugh out loud. We do it every day, I do, I know, I'm guilty of it. Well, they did the same thing, GM, good morning or SFD, stop for dinner. That was actually one of the worst codes of early. 1844, way back then, is how they first started to have social interactions that weren't face-to-face, -face, but were, in a sense, kind of that I am, that immediate type of messaging. 
So when did it really start to spread? Because obviously it didn't start to spread in 1844, right? So when did that social media really start to, to spread out? And we can see here that chat rooms started in 1984. We all know what those were. I think all of us in the room are old enough to know that you went onto your computer. Actually, it was a desktop more like this probably over here, a lot bigger. And you went into and you could type back and forth just like we do for I am and you could talk to somebody about, you know, what, whatever you like to read. I'm a Grisham fan, so I might go to a Grisham chat room or whatever. Could be about vacations, it could be to meet a new friend. So that's how it really all started. And then blogging came into place in 1999. And then you see the, the major platforms start to roll in the door. So LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. So those platforms rolled in. And they really set a foundation for social media. And it was like this explosion of consumption of social media during that time. And not necessarily for our age group, for those that were a little bit more attuned to um, electronics. So <clears throat> setting this huge platform and this foundation, and you'll see that you know, we're starting to be able to grab data because it's been 10 to 12 years now, 10 years just before the pandemic. So we were able to, to grab some data. And I want to share a side story. Um, so you're going to learn a little bit about me today. So every year in November, my mom and I go to Williamsburg to celebrate my birthday. We, now we go down to really go Christmas shopping, but we don't get a whole lot of Christmas shopping done, I will admit. But we have a, a really good time. And we always go to our favorite restaurant Friday night. And it's always packed, line out the door. It takes us a while to get in. And so this is probably around 2016-ish, somewhere around in there. And um, so we're sitting at the booth and we're just chatting about what the next day is going to be like. Okay, what are, what's our plan of action for the outlets tomorrow and what coupons are we going to use and everything. And all of a sudden we kind of stop and we're, we're looking at each other and it's weird because the restaurant's almost quiet. I mean, it wasn't quiet like a pin drop quiet, but it was kind of quiet. So we're looking around and everybody's on a device. Every single person. Even the waitress was on a device for obvious reasons. The bartender was on a device for obvious reasons, like a computer screen. But every table was full. Everybody at the bar, everybody had their face down in their device. So I looked over my mom's left shoulder and I saw this family there and I just couldn't take my mind off of them. So it was a family, a mom and dad would appear to be with two young boys, probably in middle school, a daughter that looked to be about elementary school, and all of them were on their devices the entire time. The entire time. So much so that the waitress came over and she even had to like interrupt them to take their order and to deliver their meal. And at that point, my mom and I sat and had a conversation like, what is the impact? What is the impact of this right here on our kids? So yes, it's a social tool, but is it really providing that socialization that they really need? It was interesting, very interesting. So I don't want anybody to leave from this room today saying that Patty Salen said that social media is awful for people and you should never do it. No, social media should be a balance, just like everything else in our life. And so social media has some good points. You meet good people. I mean, jobs, you got Indeed, you got LinkedIn, you got real-time news that we've never been able to have. And so there's a lot of good things that you can use on media, um, social media platforms. But I really want to talk about the negative impacts. That's why we're here today. We're focused in. We're, we're, we're literally in a crisis. We are absolutely. So I, I kind of parallel today, just like Queen Anne's County um, goes purple. And every year we come together in September and we do this kickoff to combat that crisis. And I think we've done an amazing job. But today's the day we need to do a kickoff because we are in a mental health crisis for our children. And so I really want to talk about why. Why are we in this crisis? And we're, we're in this crisis, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the brain. And I'm not going to get all technical. Um, but in our brain, we have a reward center. And that reward center sends us happy hormones called dopamine when we do something that makes us feel good. 
So again, you're gonna learn a little bit more about me. So I absolutely love pizza. I could eat pizza morning, noon, and night. I know I just must be a kid at heart, but I just like pizza. I could have any kind of pizza, white pizza, regular pizza, doesn't matter. I like pizza. And I also like JT, James Taylor. He's my favorite artist. I could listen to him all the time. So probably a favorite activity would be to get off work on a Friday night, go home, some Blair, some JT, singing some JT, and, and eating some pizza. That would be my favorite. And that whole time, my brain, my reward center is sending me out these happy hormones that says, that's making you feel good. Have another slice of pizza. Play another song of James Taylor, right? And that's great. And I'm an adult, and I know that doing that on a Friday night is fine. But I can't eat pizza every day, all day long for the rest of my life because I'd be overweight. I'd have issues with my blood pressure. Maybe I'd be a diabetic. It just doesn't make sense, right? Anybody, it's just silly to think that. And I certainly couldn't listen to James, James Taylor all the time because I wouldn't be able to get to work and get my bills paid or whatever. So as an adult, we have the capacity to make that decision of what's good for us. And when it feels good and it makes us happy and makes us warm fuzzy and gives us that good, fun, happy hormone, we know that that's great, but we can't do it all the time. We have to have a balance in our life. But our young, vulnerable children don't have the same skills we do. And that's what we need to give them as those skills. So let's change the, the storyline and say that, you know, Patty's 12 years old. She's on the weekend. Her parents are heading to St. Michael's on the boat off the dock. And she jumps on there and she takes herself in and she starts taking selfies. Seems about right for a 12, 13 year old, right? And she starts posting them on her social media. It doesn't matter what it is. It can be Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, I don't care. But then she um, posts it on there and she starts getting recognition by likes, whatever, recognitions. And every time she gets one in her brain, what's it going to do? It's going to send out that happy hormone that says, this is cool. Yeah, they like me. I must be pretty. Yeah, they're, they're my friend. I must be great. Everything's wonderful. And she tracks herself by that. And so she sends another picture because the first one went over so well. She continues to do that and continues to do that. But then she notices that Amanda also was on the boat the other day. And she was posting pictures. And Amanda got a lot more recognition than she did. So then she starts to look at herself and decide, hmm, you know, I must not be very pretty. Amanda must be prettier than I am. People must like her better than they like me. And you can obviously see that they start chipping away at their own self-esteem. And they start chipping away and making their own story. And my mom always taught me, she said, you know, if someone doesn't tell you the story, you tend to make the story up. It's what happens all the time. And I always say that at work. I say, if we don't tell the story behind the data, then someone else is going to make up the story for us. So we need to tell our story. But kids can't always do that. So she makes up her own story. So I make up my own story about Amanda. And Amanda's life must be amazing and wonderful. And mine, obviously, must not. And this is what our kids deal with every single day. Every single day. And that's the part that we need to be able to, to get in and modify. That's the part that we need to educate and provide the skill level for them to be able to look at it and make sure that that image that they took, that picture, is not who they are. And you know, being popular today is so different than being popular in our day. I mean, it's just different. And it's so hard. It's hard. And I think that's where we really need to begin. And I, I, think, uh, I think about Robin Williams. He's one of my favorite actors of all time. And I made up my own story for Robin Williams. Um, he must be the most amazing, must have been the most amazing husband, the most amazing, lovable, funny dad, the best brother anyone could have, the best son anyone could have. I mean, how could he be wrong? He's just like the most amazing person when you see him act. And yet, he lost his battle to mental illness. He did. I was shocked. I don't know if anybody else was. I was completely shocked about that because I made up my own story for him. So this is where we are. This is very recent, April 15th, 2022. This is pre-pandemic. So remember we were talking about that timeline of when those, that foundation was set? So that foundation was set and now this was 10 years later. 10 years later worth of data and we see that 40% increase of our students in high school feeling perpetually sadness and hopelessness 
This is the crisis that we're in right now. Because can we possibly imagine what it's like now that we've been going through COVID? I, I, I don't even know. I know you said 60%, and I don't even know. I don't know if it's, if it's 50, 60, 70%, I don't know. I just know that it has to be increased from here. So there's two rules that I live by for kids, and I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm just, I'm just in, I'm invested. And there's two things that I truly believe for kids, and that is don't ask them to deal with, with adult issues. They're kids, let them be kids. And don't put them in a situation that they cannot control. I remember my daughter, as clear as day, her first year in grad school, she's on her own, she's paying her own bills, you know, car payment, groceries, electric. I remember calling me saying, Mom, I don't like this adulting thing so much. <laughs> and we do laugh about it all the time, because she'll call me and she says, I don't feel like adulting today, Mom. Um, but it's true, we shouldn't, we shouldn't put that. And look at what COVID has done to our kids. We absolutely, we gave them things that were adult issues, like I don't have food to put in front of you today. You don't have internet, you can't connect to your teacher today. Those are adult issues, those are not kid issues. And talk about situations they can't control, no prom, no graduation, no birthday party, no Christmas with your family. Serious stuff, some really serious stuff. So COVID, whew, I wanna take a step back because it really, it's hard even just thinking way back to the very beginning. So I'll share with you just a little, a little of the forefront of what we were dealing with. So on March 11th, we get an email, a superintendent's, that says that the governor and our state superintendent are gonna do a news release, press release, in the evening. And just FYI, you should be there. We got zero heads up other than that. So I, of course, was in Caroline at that point, called together all the principals, the board members, and some key players, um, assistant superintendent, um, your um, transportation person, your food service person, and we all come to one room and um, watch as it unfolds. So um, turn, turn the TV off and we say, we gotta create a plan of action. And that's what we did. We created a plan of action. We did the very best that we could to make sure that the very next day, because that, well, that, that was Wednesday, so that Friday when the kids went, that Monday we would have food delivered to houses and made sure that kids that needed packets got what they needed if we couldn't get it together by that Friday. Um, and then subsequently, as everyone knows, we were closed down for that entire um, spring and students weren't allowed to come in. Nobody was actually allowed to really be anywhere. Everybody was kind of on lockdown. But we did the very best we could to connect with kids. But we couldn't connect with all of them. And I know that everybody knows that. And so that summer we were able to get our highly need students in, your special education, English language learners, and, and by that fall, on the first day of school, the governor came to Caroline County. We were one of the only districts that had students in session. And we continued to bring kids back and had uh, most of our kids back. Um, by, before Thanksgiving, we had all of them back. Um, and then by second semester, we were well on our way, and, and it was good. In Queen Anne's County, they were able to get um, uh, CCTC students back, some special needs um, students back, um, early, very early on, and then um, by second semester they had everybody back on a modified schedule, which was great and amazing and such a heavy lift for so many people. Um, and, and again, we did the best that we could with what we had, but it wasn't good enough for some kids. It just wasn't good enough for some kids. And some of our kids had to deal with those adult problems and they had to go to work and they supported their family when their mom couldn't or they lost their caretaker to COVID. It, it was hard. So our enrollment was down this year and last year to combine 380 students. That's significant. Now some of those students are in private schools. Some of them are homeschooled, successfully so. And that's the right thing for their family. And kudos to them for knowing what was good for their family and making sure that their child got what they need. But some of our kids we just lost and we won't get back. They either decided not to come back and they're working, as I said, to support their family, um, kind of missing in action type thing. So 
hard, hard, hard. Someone also asked me to address today of if I had to, to really hone in on who did I think was needed the most out of all the grade bands, who would it be? And I would have to say that I feel like our second graders, because they miss their total foundation of reading, and, and I would have to say our ninth graders who missed basically their entire middle school career. And they have struggled. Our ninth graders have struggled and our second graders have struggled. And the good news is, is that we have a lot of grants and a lot of money that are coming down filtered to us where we have been able to target some of those um, interventions and some tutoring opportunities for kids. We've been able to partner with different companies. We've offered tutoring before school, during school, after school, um, even as late as people can pick up the phone and get a tutorer at nighttime. We've contracted with some different folks to do that. So um, we have a good plan of action and we're, we're certainly in the right direction. But I can tell you that it's, it's certainly been a heavy lift and and we certainly haven't been able to to meet the needs of every single student like we would have if we were in bricks and mortar the whole time so then we, that takes us to the beginning of this school year which we thought was going to be fantastic we had this robust um, middle school I mean robust after school program not after school a robust summer school program <laughs> last year in um, in July and um, the end of June and July and uh, students came in no masks it, it really was amazing we, we served over a thousand students in summer school programming last summer we thought this year we we're gonna just kick off run right in the door no problem everything was good principals were geared up ready to go and then we had this and we go right back to giving kids situations that they can't control and also putting kids in situations um, where they are in the midst of an adult decision. So we had masks versus no mask. We had vaccination versus no vaccination. We had quarantining versus no quarantining. And we had testing versus no testing. And it was a challenge. Again, it was a challenge, but this year we, you know, I can say that we were open the entire school year. We didn't have to close any one school for a spread. Um, and teachers amazingly were able to um, get students caught up and focus in on um, some strategies to be able to, to fix the gaps that were there. And for next year, we've planned, um, we even have some of our teachers that are looping, and that's a strategy in education that we use where you already have a relationship with your students, so I'm gonna move up a grade with them so that there's no you know, downtime in the beginning to set relationships, so you, those relationships are already set. So we have some good strategies in place, and we also have another robust summer school program planned and prepared and ready to go, and we're excited about that. So with all that being said, you looked at the, the statistics prior to the pandemic, and now you just looked at what we've been through during the pandemic, and there's no surprise to you that this is our kids right now. And if you look in there, you see anxiety, exhaustion, um, you know, pain, panic. I mean, this is where a lot of our kids are sitting. And I know that you all are healthcare providers. Many of you provide services. And I know that you know this because you meet with these students who are, their fuse is lit right now. And they're just about ready to lose it. And so what happens when you have a time bomb ticking, right? Obviously, you're gonna have some repercussions of that. And so while we don't have any solid data this year, we can, we know, anecdotally speaking, that we've seen misbehaviors um, on the rise. We've seen fighting on the rise. And I kind of equate it to, and I know this sounds a little silly, but you know, a, a, a two-year-old um, who is aggressive, maybe bite somebody. I don't know if you had a two-year-old that ever bit somebody at daycare. I don't want to talk about who might have had that, but at least she bit her own brother. I mean, you know, at least she bit her own brother. But anyways, it's like you tell them, use your words, right? Use your words. And I feel like our kids haven't been able to use their words because they haven't been able to access that person to use their words. And so they're, they're headed this direction. And specifically speaking, dramatically so, in the fall of 2019, we only had 11 referrals for physical aggression. And this fall, we had 50. So 
again, not being able to use their words, not being able to access what they need, um, to be able to express what they're going through. I mean, we don't know what they're going, I don't know what they're going through. I mean, I'm one of the lucky ones. I haven't lost anybody in my personal family to COVID, but a lot of our kids have. A lot of our kids have. And, and how did they deal with that? It's hard enough for us to deal with the death in our family. How, how does an eight-year-old deal with it? A 10-year-old, a 16-year-old? It's hard. So in Queen Anne's County, what we decided to do this year was to do a needs assessment to start building for a strategic plan. And during that needs assessment, um, we came out with five different themes. And one of those themes was the well-being of our students. And so that's actually one of our goals. And we've back mapped that goal. And what do we need to do in order to meet students' needs? Because we know that this is a crisis. So this current school year, we put in two new float nurses. We also put in two um, mental health providers in the form of like social workers. And believe me, that hasn't touched it. Next year, because of strategic planning and the need that is there, we've added two additional guidance counselors at two of our middle schools, and we're also adding, and again, two additional um, social workers. And we have back mapped that out to what do we need to continue to add. Um, and it would be great if we had the money tree that fell out of the sky and we could hire uh, you know, tenfold that, it would be amazing, but we really do have to build it into our budget. Um, but we're planning for it, we know it, because our kids need to access those services. We have been um, <clears throat> creating and, and stabilizing existing relation relationships that we have as it relates to mediation, as it relates to community partnerships with For All Seasons and many, many others. And so I feel strongly that we will continue those and to be able to bring those services into schools. Another thing is, is working with the commissioners, we have um, been pursuing um, transportation for summertime, so it's great. We've got our kids in session right now, and our kids are getting services right on our property right during school, but what happens when summer comes? So we're trying to make sure that there's no disconnect between um, those services and that they're that it's smooth through the summer months. So we have a lot of work going on behind the scenes with the team. But today, if we can do anything at all of before we leave this room today is make a pack that Whatever we do, we get this message out to our kids that it's okay to not be okay. Like that should be our message. It's okay to not be okay. That should be a normalized conversation. That should help us to remove the stigma that's there. It should really be an opportunity for us to provide the supports we need and get early intervention into the, to our kids. But our kids need to understand that sometimes, you know what, when you fail a test, it's awful. I get it. It's terrible. But it's okay to feel that way. You should be upset. You studied really hard. You put a lot of time and energy into it. So we need to teach them that when things happen, you're suppo it's, it's normal to have those kinds of reactions, that it doesn't mean that it is the end of everything, that what does it look like next? And what I do with my own son, who has been challenged with social anxiety, and I say to him, you know, he's got this big test, he's wound up, he's a nervous wreck, and I mean, anxiety out, out the roof, and I say, okay, what's gonna happen if you fail the test? Well, if I fail the test, I, I might fail the course. Okay, what happens if you fail the course? Well, well then I might have to repeat it. Okay, so what happens then? Well, then I'd have to put this class off to the following. So, okay, okay, but it's not the end of the world, right? You can always make it work. So sometimes just giving them that pathway of, yeah, it does, it's terrible, it stinks, but what's next? So it's, all, it's okay to be okay. And I really wanna end with this. And I know this is gonna seem like the silliest little thing in the whole wide world, but for me it's very, very powerful is the word routine. Routine. And I don't know if you've ever seen, I'll go back to that two-year-old that's off the routine. It's a nightmare, isn't it? Like we keep our kids little, we keep our littles on a routine for a reason because it makes our life easier. It makes their life easier. But why do we stop that? Why is it that when they get to upper elementary school, into middle school, into high school, 
that we don't, we don't encourage and almost demand that they have this balance of a routine, a balance of, of eating well, of sleeping well, of exercising well, and socializing well. So instead of having free reign to this all the time, there should be, and there's two different kinds of socializing. There's socializing online, and then there's socializing. And we need to make sure that our kids have that routine, and we need to be good stewards of that. We need to make sure that we are good role models of that. And I try to do that every day with my kids. Every day, balance. Mom, can I have this? You know, when they were little. Can I have this candy? Sure. Can you have 25 pieces of it? No. Everything in moderation, right? Everything in moderation and routine. Stick to a routine. I tell you, our kids thrive on routines. And honestly, me, I'm grouchy when I'm off my routine. I really am. I haven't been well. I wasn't well last week. And I haven't been able to work out. And it's gr I'm grouchy. Like, that's my outlet. You know, and I'm just a creature of habit in the morning. I have a routine. I get up and I play words. You guys are learning much too much about me. But I get up in the morning. Like, first thing, I just want to play my words with friends. Five minutes tops. Five minutes. And at night, to like bring my head down, I just want to play my words with friends. Like, it's like easy, but it's part of my routine, and it's not excessive, it's in balance. So if anything we can do today before we leave is to really think about it's okay to be okay, and let's get our kids in a good routine. So thank you so much for the opportunity to talk on such an important topic. You guys have been amazing. So very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Salins. And I don't know about you all, but I don't feel like adulting any day of the week. <laughs> so we are, we are right there. And I really am so glad you mentioned the, on the one slide, it's, not, it's OK to not be OK. I think we need to take that one step further and say it's not OK to hide the fact that you're not OK. And so I just want to start on something personal and say that I would ask that everybody in this room think right now just for a moment about who that person is for you to call if you're not OK. Because we can't help our kids, we can't help our families if, if we're not okay. And just a very interesting story, and then I promise we're going to get to our panel. Um, and this is in the spirit of thanking our school system for the wonderful resources that they have. I had an opportunity a few years ago to work in the county's command center for COVID. And during that time, my role was not always the most comfortable one. I was the guy that was helping to write the policies and procedures for shutting things down. And I remember in doing that and having conference calls with restaurant owners and having to explain, well, this isn't really for debate. <laughs> These are the things we've been told you can and can't do, and this is how we're going to implement that in our community. And having conversations with the school system about transitioning from in-person to virtual learning. And so it was a busy time, and that was not lost on my children. Well, I have a daughter that's in the public school system who uh, was being bullied for about a year and a half during the time of the pandemic and did not disclose that to my wife and I. And when it did come out, I remember her telling me, our kids, you know, I've, I've said to my wife, I really hope our kids are compassionate and they help their community. And I think our kids sometimes do things to a fault. So my wonderful daughter, to a fault, said when I asked her, why have you been allowing this bullying to go on this long? There's great resources in the school system. And by the way, they're doing a great job at Centerville Middle. Um, but why did you allow all this to go on? And she said, well, I knew how overwhelmed you were with all the stuff in the pandemic, and I didn't want to add to your burdens. That was my, at the time, 10-year-old daughter. So think about those burdens. I, I think all the things you shared, Dr. Salins. I want to call you Patty, but I just can't do it. Dr. Salins. Um, Pat, Dr. Patty Salins. There, I got it. Um, just everything you said was so wonderful. We thank you for that. Um, as we invite our panel to come forward in just a moment, just to give you a feel for who's in the room with you today, um, raise your hand if you are with the public schools. OK, a lot of folks from public school system. Private mental health providers. Yes, thank you. Uh, local state government agencies, okay. Child care, early child care services, wonderful. Law enforcement, juvenile justice, justice system in general. Yep, great, thank you. 
Um, so we have a, a good diversity of folks, and I think this is the first time we've ever, ever really been able to bring this, this group of people with such diversity and breadth and depth together. So again, thank you for coming, and I want to thank, because I don't want to forget to do this before the end of the conference today, if you serve as an active or, su or supportive member of the Children's Council, would you just raise your hand? So that's the folks that are putting on this event today, and if you were on the committee for the summit, if you would just raise your hand. If you guys could just give those folks a round of applause for <laughs> helping to uh, pull this together. So thank everyone. I want to bring Elizabeth Miller, the uh, Children's Council co-chair, uh, back to the front here. And we would like to invite our panelists to take the stage. I'm going to. So we want to welcome our panelists here and thank them for providing some great insight into this topic. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with introductions of the panelists. And we'll start on the left with Susan Coppage. And just tell everybody who you are, what you do, and a little bit of history about yourself. So this is why I didn't want to sit here. <laughs> I didn't want to walk in first. <laughs> I'm Susan Coppage. I am the director of social services. I'm here in Queen Anne's County. I've been the director for about six years, but I've been um, at Queen Anne's County Social Services for 13 and with the Department of Human Services for 20. So um, did you ask me a question along with that? Not yet. We're going to okay. get the introductions, and then we'll go on to questions. All right. That was easy, then. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Ann Langrill. I'm the president and CEO of For All Seasons, the Community's Behavioral Health and Rape Crisis Center. Our agency serves the English and Spanish speaking communities regardless of one's ability to pay. Um, I've been with the agency just over nine years and prior to that spent 15 years in the higher education system. Hi, I'm Amanda Enzer. I am the Family Engagement Specialist for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Um, I've been with Queen Anne's County Public Schools for 19 years, 15 as a classroom teacher and four years as Family Engagement Specialist. Hi everyone, my name is Alex Chan. Um, I'm with the University of Maryland Extension um, in the Family and Consumer Sciences program. So I'm the mental health specialist, which means I develop programs, um, community-based programs, uh, that are in the area of mental health, stress management, family relations. Um, so that's what I do full-time and part-time. I work for a private practice um, in DC called the Sibley Group. Um, I'm also a marriage and family therapist there. So um, that's what I do. Sean Kenna, uh, about 22 years ago, started my career in education. I've been in Queen Anne's ever since. Uh, I was a social studies teacher, football coach, and have been uh, to this point principal at every level of our school system. And from Southersville to Kent Island, I know most of the faces in the room at this point. So, sure. I'm, I'm Maria Radowski Stanko. I'm the director of Child, Adolescent, and Young Adult Services um, for State at the Behavioral Health Authority and mom of three teenage boys and I have to confess to taking a picture of the um, slide on mental health and the social media um, and sending that back out to my kids during the call because that is a very popular topic in my house. So what we did before the event is we distributed some questions to the panelists. So we're going to start with asking them these questions and then we're going to turn it over to the audience and have you ask the panelists some questions. So the first question we have for... I have it. Okay. You got it. Um, why do you feel it was important to be on the panel and to engage this particular topic, Susan? Well, I think that... Um one, Eric asked, <laughs> and you don't say no to Eric. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, for the work that we do at social services, mental health is key. Um, if everyone had, was healthy, with their mental health was healthy, then we probably wouldn't have jobs. Um, a lot of it really um, goes back to mental health. And so I really hoped to be able to um, give as much as I got out of this. Mm -hmm. Great answer. I'm with Susan, Eric asked, and you say yes. Um, <laughs> but I think the other piece is that it's really important for us to come together as a community and have the conversations that we're gonna be having today. And the importance of partnerships, you know, none of us do it 
all alone and we do it better together. Um, I say as a CEO all the time, my job is not to be the expert in everything. My job is to bring the experts to the table and allow them to do what they do well. And the people sitting up here with me are part of the partners that we do it so well because we do it together. And so for me, it was about strengthening those partnerships, about having these important conversations and I'm with Susan, like hoping that we're going to learn something together as a panel as much as we're going to learn from the audience. Wonderful. So I'm going to um, go back a little bit to answer that. Um, 15 years in the classroom, I didn't know that most of you existed. Um, and so for me, I stepped out of the classroom into this role as a family engagement specialist, and it was like, we have that in Queen Anne's County. Oh, that person does this in Queen Anne's County. Or so as a teacher, and an educator, and I'm sure some of you feel this way too, we are so siloed into our very little boxes, um, but we are all ultimately working for the same cause, right? And the same people, humans. So today, um, to be part of this panel is important for me to have an opportunity to have a voice with the larger community. I probably have emailed all of you at some point about someone or asking for something, um, but to have everybody in the same room together and put a face to those names. And in addition, just realize that there are so many people in this, in this community working together for these, these same children or our same students and how important it is for those larger connections to be made. Because there are a lot of teachers who spend a lot of time with kids every day who don't know that all these services exist. So that's for me. I don't think I'm going to say anything new here um, <laughs> with my role with Extension. So for those of you who aren't familiar, um, Extension is the non-formal educational wing of the University of Maryland. And throughout our over 100 year history, um, part of what we have done has been to serve as a convener. Now, of course, I didn't convene this event, but I'm, I'm interested in the connections, just like my um, fellow panelists are, uh, because we're in the business of program development and we're in the business of generating, um, responding to the needs of the community. So it's really important for us to be here to listen um, and also to take what we hear and work with both our faculty who are based around the state as well as you all in the community to develop the programming that you want, because it's not fun to have people say this is what you need when they haven't listened first, so. I have two biological children uh, who went through Queen Anne's County Public Schools. I have probably about 7,000 children uh, overall. Uh, a couple of them are sitting here in the audience today who sat in my classroom. Um, they are all important to me and everything that they are going through is important to me. And I, I do think this is a great uh, first step that hopefully continues from here. Uh, as Eric and I talked about, it's just important for the conversation to really happen between all of us because I send my students to some of you for independent services and you don't know what I know and I don't know what you're saying to them um, and I understand the privacy and the confidentiality but when we all understand each other and we have an opportunity to share these things transparently and talk about things like yep social media and fights in the bathroom and why kids are getting mouthy with teachers and what the heck's going on and we have a chance to break it all out and talk about it in a um, calm environment like this to really do the best for our kids, our biological children, and the other thousands of children that we serve every day are better off for it. I, I think my answer is, is really two parts. Um, one is that I walked into my position at the state saying we needed to expand, improve the crisis services for children um, in a response to the growing mental health issues. Um, that was just prior to COVID. Um, so as pointed out earlier, COVID has just exploded this issue. Um, and, and the second is, is the issue of breaking down the silos. Um, you know, I've had, had experience around the state and, and working with the state rather than before I was actually employed by them. Um, and I saw the fact that our organizations didn't talk to each other and that state level, that's state to local, that's local agencies with each other is better or worse in different places. So. Both of those reasons are why this appealed to me, and I'm, I'm here as part of this. Thank you. Now I'm going to bounce around a little bit. I'm going to, we don't have to go down the line. So I'm going to go with Beth, Beth Ann first. What was the most unexpected or profound lesson you learned from the pandemic? 
So I think um, for me, the, there's two lessons. I think one of them is the importance that we all recognize that we all struggle and the ability to bring words and an ownness to the fact that every single one of us in this room felt something different than we had felt prior to the pandemic. And for so long, we have talked about mental health and diagnoses. And one of the things that I've learned leading an organization and as a mom with two young boys is that we really need to be talking about mental health symptoms because we get stuck in the diagnosis end of things. And I may not identify as someone who has a mental health diagnosis, but I sure can tell you that anxiety and stress and mental health symptoms showed up in my family in different ways. And I think it, that sort of dovetails into what I learned as a mom, what I learned as a supervisor, what I learned as a friend, is that we have to continuously fill the bucket of our little people. We have to fill the bucket of the people in our circle. And there comes a point at which the bucket tips over. And when it's empty, it's our job to pick those pieces back up. But if we're not filling our own bucket as a human being, then we have a difficult time giving what our children need. And so one of the things that we learned as a family that I've learned running a company is that self-care piece and teaching the skills and tools to be able to say, what are you doing for yourself during these times? We cannot help our children to the full capacity that our children need if our bucket is empty. And being able to say, mommy needs a timeout, or you need a timeout, because I was not at my best as a mom. I was not at my best as a boss when I was at a capacity <laughs> of, it's one too many things. And the art of being able in those moments to give ourselves permission to get it wrong is really important. To be able to say, I'm doing my very best and take that step back as community partners. I can't tell you how many times in the past two years when it comes to what was happening in our school systems that I would be the voice at the table saying, we have like 15% of the information and there's 85% of the information that we don't know and everyone is doing the very best that they can. And so rather than moving to judgment, let's move to a place where everybody's bringing their best to the table and that helps our kids <laughs> learn that too. It's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to not get it right, this is the first time any superintendent had been through a pandemic. You know, it's not always going to go the way that we believe it's going to go. And so helping to build some of those skills and tools for our kids was really what I took from the pandemic overall. Susan, since you're down there, what did you learn? So one of the things was, that was most profound for me was um, the my staff. It was amazing to see them come together the way they did and to um, pivot. I mean, it was constant. One day, on a Friday, we were told that we weren't coming in the office on Monday. And then we had, I think, two weeks that we were pretty much shut down. And then we had to figure out how to start it all back up again. And we had very little technology. Um, people were more than willing to use their own cell phones, to use their own computers until we got computers. Um, our, like, the amount of um, food stamp applications we were receiving had doubled. It was just amazing to see. I mean, I knew in traumatic events, our staff comes together and gets it done. But this wasn't just a traumatic event. It was this long standing, and we, we're not out of it. I mean, it's still happening. And the, the piece now is that people aren't even as aware that it's still happening. I mean, what we're doing to ourselves with conference calls, with um, now we're doing in person things, and we're trying to get from an in person meeting to a conference call, we're doing them in our cars. I mean, we've got to start thinking about making sure that we're staying healthy and i want to make sure you know for my from my staff's perspective that um they're looking at that and we're just taking care of each other because it's just so important and um it, it's just amazing i think that you know we're in a small community and everybody has seen that it happened in all our organizations um but for me, it was just really this profound thought around, wow, 
<laughs> like everything we threw at them, they handled and they handled with ease. Um, and so it was just so comforting. <laughs> it really was as an administrator. That's good to hear. Alex. So I think what I realized was um, more personal um, for a profound thing from the, the pandemic. And it was kind of two, two opposites. Like one was how much I could handle personally uh, in, um, as I actually, during the pandemic at the beginning in April, I transitioned to the role that I now occupy, which is the mental health specialist. Uh, and so with that combined with doing private practice work, my work became mental health all day, every day. And uh, when I went to graduate school, uh, I had decided not to be a full-time therapist um, because I realized that the burden emotionally was not something I wanted to do uh, all the time. And so, but then I jumped into this more like educational mental health role. Um, so it was still almost like all mental health all the time and it is that way today. And I realized, wow, I can do this. Like this is really neat that I'm, able to do this and I'm able to um, respond like I felt very needed during the pandemic and, and still do. Um, so that's been a really personally like profound thing. It's like I feel like I'm meeting a need and I bet a lot of you feel that way too. Like everyone in here is some form of essential occupation and but I think that for maybe for a lot of us that the pandemic reinforced like how essential we all are. And so I thought that was great. At the same time, I realized that you can only be at that high capacity for so long. Uh, and so, and I realized that the impact of internalized stigma was something that even I wasn't immune from as a educator by day and you know interventionist by night. Like I, I, I realized that even though I'm talking about stigma and talking about dismantling the the you know taboo around discussing it more openly uh, that I was doing it to myself. So it took me until February of this year to see my own therapist. Um, even though you know I've been doing mental health for you know over 10 years and you know I've been in the you know the business for quite a while, it took me that long to realize. Wait, I've been breathing this in about like being independent and self-reliant uh, and and trying to live that out even as I preach, like it's okay to depend on other people. So I think probably a lot of us are guilty of that too, is that we're making it okay for other people to talk about it, but then when it comes to us, you're still like, well, I should try a few more things before I go see a therapist. That's thought repeated over and over and over again um, in my head. And I was like, I know I should see a therapist, um, you know, if it gets to a certain point, but I feel like, well, I didn't fully follow the advice of this one person yet. I didn't fully try this thing. So once I get to like my own evaluation of 100% compliance with all the self-care activities, then like, <laughs> then if I'm still not doing okay, then I can go see a therapist. And that's just too far of a hurdle for yourself. Yeah. Like no one's ever gonna be at 100% self-care, mm -hmm. um, adults or children. And so we have to set the bar lower in a sense to accept help. Um, and so that's, that's been a, a big uh, learning thing for me. That was a great point. Yeah. Amanda. All right, so I'm gonna start with my silver linings um, from this. The first one, and it's not that we didn't know this, but schools became larger lifelines than they already were. And what I realized very, very quickly that as soon as schools were closed, it was um, the needs that came to my attention or that I was seeking resources for, um, we had all been offering in schools. And I know that sounds silly, but there was some, you know, it was simple, simple things. And so our school communities, especially in a small town or a small county like Queen Anne's, they really are the hubs. They really are lifelines for so many of our families, so many of our students. And they're also a um, source of trust, a source of comfort. I was finding that, you know, simple things. Have asking a family to come to the school to pick up a meal, they were much faster to do that than having meet me at another public location. Or other organizations would say, how are you getting these into the hands? And I said, well, we're inviting them to the school parking lot. 
and they would come. So I think that's another piece too, and I, as Dr. Salen said, the importance of continuing those services throughout the summer and other times, but keeping that connection with the schools because that is truly where some of our most underserved and neediest families find as their safe haven, and we have got to monopolize on that relationship. So that was one silver lining. Um, the other thing, and this is very small, but it goes into the expansion of CT and all, and just um, sort of mindset, is kids kind of came back with some very high interests. So all of a sudden it was like, Miss Enzer, so you know, when I was at home for all these times, I started reading about this, and then, um, and you had to listen, but for me, it was a really great way to lead them on a pathway for their education. Did you know you were always interested in that? Or did you know when you get to high school, there's this course that you could do? So the, the whole idea of, um, I, I really do feel that a lot of our, our students found some of their greatest strengths while they were, um, while they were home or during that during that time. So I want to point that out too because it wasn't all, you know, they were struggling but they also had some just new discoveries about themselves on a, in a positive way. Um, on the other side of that, two things. We never learned uh, more about the power of access than we did during that time. And we use that word access frequently and lightly, um, but it was access to a lot of things. Something as simple as a gallon of milk, to a COVID test, to whatever it was, but access spoke volumes from the southern end to the northern end of the county, and that's something I think we really need to continue working on. Um, and the other point, and Dr. Salen's mentioned this in her, her keynote as well, but what I was also finding is that the children were repeating the adults, or the words of the adults. And so all of a sudden, all of our students were coming back. Well, we've had this learning loss, and we've done this, and everything was so negative, and it was, out of the mouths of those around them, right? And so a biggest thing was we had to, you know, my message at the time was stop saying those things, right? Our, we know our words matter, but our, our children are listening. So if they all come back thinking that they have these learning gaps or they're thinking they're behind or whatever language we were using or getting back to normal, well, what does normal really mean? So I think that's another big piece too is that, um, our words matter so, so much. And so it's all the adults in this profession or this, these professions and whatnot. It's so important for us to continue using those words strategically because the, the children are listening and they will repeat them and that will become their mantras too. Um, so those were some of the major lessons for me. Thank you. Sean. I think I would probably say what I learned was more of a reminder and it didn't occur for me until everybody was back. Um, and the reminder was this, as much as we in education, and a lot of you don't see this on a daily basis, sit down and focus on, is this curriculum right? Is this assessment right? Do we have our academics in line for every single kid to meet the needs of every single kid? At least 50%, and I don't know if that's, that's just my subjective percentage on it, at least 50% of coming to school is growing up. It's not about math and reading and writing, 50% of what happens in that building every day is growing up. It is having a teacher that you have a disagreement with, pushing in the milk snack line, having a girlfriend for a minute and then I don't have a girlfriend anymore and we broke up, and going through those things that happen every moment in a school. We all said it while we were out and we said this is damaging children and the experts like you in the room went, this is hurting the kids. We all kind of knew it and we just didn't know how much until they got back. Mm -hmm. The thing I learned the most is, we always have to keep an eye on the intangibles that happen in a school, the growing up that happens in school. We cannot take our eye off academics. We're supposed to make smart little citizens and send them off into the world. Mm -hmm. But we have to recognize the environment that we provide and I think it re sort of retrained my eye on that and the moments in school when you do get pushed in the snack line because the kid behind you wanted the soft pretzel first or you did break up with your girlfriend. Those aren't things that we as adults should go, oh, it's just a kid thing, get over it and go to the back of the line. And Take a moment, and it sort of reinforced in my brain, take a moment to sit there with those kids. That's part of what we do. It's not just math, reading, and writing. And I'm, 
I hate to say it, I had a conference like bad things about the pandemic, but I'm glad that happened. That kind of refocused us a little bit on that. And I'll just tip of the hat to the teachers who were on the ground from kindergarten up to senior year dealing with that every day. I'll tell you something kind of negative, um, but it's a barometer that we need to talk about. Just yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, I have one of the best teachers I have at my school, came sat with me, and she said, I just can't do it anymore. And I think that it is, we're here to talk about, as the sign says, and everybody talks about the kids, but we're also talking about self-care for each other. That's been mentioned several times so far this afternoon. We better take care of ourselves and our staff because they're the ones who are on the ground actually handling this. And I'm, I'm not talking about budgets and contracts and negotiations. I'm talking about we better look at each other and hug and handshake and compliment and take care of each other. There's, there's a movie, and I, I, I guess I'll put it like this. There are teachers, I know principals feel this way. Most, some people who are in charge of things feel this way, like you just gotta be the man. There you can't have emotions and you gotta have the answers and here comes people who are emotional and you can't be emotional. You gotta like deal with them and help them and all that kind of stuff. There's a movie uh, called League of Their Own where Tom Hanks is sitting there screaming at one of the female baseball players and said, there's no crying in baseball. <laughs> if I learned anything, I think there might be crying in baseball. Thank you for bringing up that point. So important, self-care. Um, I'd love to hear your point, and I just want to make sure I'm pronounced Maria. 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 Okay. Um, first of all, a lot of what's being said, I mean, I think is all absolutely true and um, resonates with a lot. Um, a couple of a couple of points that I did you know, I think really struck me, um, and, and this has been said a little bit, but the resiliency of our organizations and our systems, how fast things shifted, how fast things pivoted, what all was being done. Um, obviously, a lot of the audience here is, is education, and I can remember sitting on the Children's Cabinet and Secretary Salman talking about what the schools were doing, and I had never even given a thought about the meals and getting the meals out to family and how important that was, but I can remember that meeting virtual as everything was, um, and, and just my eyes being opened by, oh my gosh, there's a whole nother piece of schooling that you know I hadn't really given any thought of, so, thought to. Um, the, other, the other thing is, I think what's, what I've been concerned with and have been struck by is the increase in the gap between you know, our, our well-off, affluent families, our kids, parents being home, able to be home, how wonderful that was. You actually ended up getting more time with your kids and this was a nice thing. You know, you could get on Instacart, have somebody deliver your groceries when you really wanted to. They're, they're that side versus the side that, you know, doesn't have that support, is struggling, can't get their kids onto an internet. And, and the spread between those two, I think, has gotten worse. Mm -hmm. And that scares me. Um, and that scares me as to the impact over an entire generation. It scares me to the kids that were mentioned earlier that have been lost out of education because they've been pulled into being parents for other siblings. They've been pulled into being taken care of the household and keeping things together. Um, and, and what that means concerns me greatly. Um, you know, and it, it's come to bring everybody's attention to the fact that what is it that's, you know, is coming out of these systems that we didn't consider in the very beginning, but what else is being provided by schools and socialization and the connection to other, other students and all that that, you know, we were not as aware of early on. Now, you want to segue to questions from the audience? So if anybody has a question for the panelists, I can come your way, okay? Okay. Okay. You can just. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I just want to. Um, I'm Audrey Shabani from Mitchell Behavioral Health, and I just want to continue on with what Dr. Maria was just saying. The gap has gotten bigger, mm -hmm. and we're seeing more of those kids, um, and we're seeing more of those families falling apart, and we're seeing the short term. I, I, I'm worried about in 10 years from now what's going to have what our communities are going to even look like. But so what can we, as a county, and, and no, this is not my home county, but it's a county that I've worked in for many years, and what can we do, or what is being done, and what can we do more of 
to really address that gap because if we don't address that gap and get those social emotional skills and get those kids caught back up <coughs> on target it's a generation we're going to lose and and i'm afraid of that so what can we do and how can we help you so we can all talk about whatever help you'd like to offer but i will tell you <laughs> I will tell you, and I, I know this is going to sound like duh coming from the principal, but I'm saying this and I'll scream it from the rooftop at the top of my lungs. Our teachers are the front line. Our teachers are the front line. They, they are the one, and I should say all of our staff members are the front line. Our counselors, our teachers, our support staff in the buildings, they are the front line with the kids. And I had mentioned taking care of them, but I think it, as Amanda pointed out as well, Sometimes they're not even aware of all the resources they're standing standing in front of them. They're just trying to stand there in front of the room and manage all the stuff that they're managing without crying in baseball. They're trying to be the leaders, and 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 I think that part of this, I think so far, I don't, I don't want to take anything away from anything anybody said, but one of the things that I immediately wrote down in my head is, you know what, Amanda's right. We, we don't know what's out there for each other. Some of you guys are going, how come my phone isn't ringing off the hook? Some of you guys are like, I'm underwater. I got too many people. I don't have enough seats. But if we put all that on the table, that's what makes these conferences very valuable. And what could you offer would be different than what somebody 10 seats down could offer. But I, I will say, I'm sorry I'm the principal saying it, but the next time you see a teacher, give them a hug. They are the front line and shake your hand, shake their hand and say, and I can offer this. And you should talk to your counselor about this for you or your kids. And I'm going to piggyback off of that. Um, so I work very closely with a lot of our Latino population in the northern end of the county, some who suffered from a extreme lack of access through this entire process. And one of the fathers up there, the first time we had him back in person from my family learning community, um, we had this conversation is what what was it that you what did you need? What did you, you know, realize more than ever? And he said it was that he himself didn't know how to deal with his own emotions, let alone helping a, his five-year-old deal with her emotions. And this was coming from, you know, this was all in Spanish with the, with the interpreter and so forth. Um, so I'm, I do think that that's the other piece too, is that, and, and this is, I mean, my job is family engagement specialist, but we have got to do a better job of also including our families in these conversations. And when I say family, I say this with a very general, right? A family in this work is all the important people in a child's life. And sometimes what we send home for services is directed to mom or dad or whoever the first contact is on power school. And I know there's legalities with all of that. But quite honestly, it's real easy to talk to a kid and say, so who matters most in your life? And that's kind of where we're missing some of our connections, especially with our underserved um, population and those that really felt that gap more than anything, because there are certain people who they will talk to and trust and listen to. And I said, let me introduce you to my friend here. He's an expert in this. And just that little triangular conversation is gonna open up that door for that child and that family. So I think that's a huge piece of it as well. You brought up a good point about connecting to families, and Eric may want to elaborate on where that we're going with this particular um, topic that we're, and all the data that we're going to get from today. We're going to take it on the road. And I'll be quick, mm -hmm. if you believe that. That will help, you know, elaborate. <laughs> I try to be brief, um, because I am not on the panel. We want to hear more from them. But it, people have asked the question, including Doug Bishop um, from the Bay Times Record Observer, why did you not include families, children, and youth in this event. We did think about that, I promise you. What occurred to us is we wanted to bring folks that were on the front line together who really understand where the gaps are, where the breaking points are. So we have our keynote speaker who really helped set the tone, our panelists who right now and will continue to help us kind of think through the challenges, the solutions, the opportunities, the things that we want to highlight are going very well. So when they get done and we go into the needs assessment, which we'll talk about later, um, we will talk about sustains, we'll talk about challenges and solutions. You all will vote on those to prioritize. And then in the fall, we're gonna take the show on the road and go into the northern part of the community and do an event at Sellersville. Maybe do another event, event in the northern part of our community where we talk to our Hispanic community. And do something in Centerville, do something on Kent Island where we will find a way to incentivize parents and their children to come into the room with us and say, this is what we discussed. Where do we have it right? Where do we have it wrong? What are we missing? So that's where this is, this is headed. Town hall meetings, yeah. 
Thank you. All right, Beth. I just want to piggyback on what Amanda said. I think um, so, you know, some of what we also have to do is we have to get out of our own way and realize that nothing changes if nothing changes. And if we continue to do things the same way, we are going to get the same results. And so part of it where we work um, really hard and we don't always get it right at our agency is to think about the lens that we're coming to. You know, I'm coming to a conversation as a privileged white woman who's the CEO of a company, I have to think differently for the, ch for the children that we're serving, for the families that we're serving. And I think about um, a program that Amanda and Ivy Garcia, who leads our Latino outreach and education program, put together. When the pandemic happened, our offices never closed. And so Ivy would go to Sudlersville and meet with families. And so you know, one of the things that she did was a sewing group. And so the option was, does the sewing group just shut down? No, we figured out a way to get a sewing machine to each one of those members' homes, and they sewed on Zoom, and they sewed masks. And so it was not something that we'd thought about. You know, the way that we reach people, our office spent more time delivering stickers to pizza places that there could be our sticker placed on pizza boxes because our sexual assault line stopped getting phone calls when the pandemic happened because it wasn't safe to make phone calls anymore. So if we could get stickers out to the delivery folks as these Instacart things are coming, as pizza boxes are showing up, you know, we increased our crisis appointments. Um, Abby was working for us at the time and I see her out there. Abby showed up every day and, and she helped deliver stickers and you know our, our folks had to step up differently. But I think the other co important component component is that you know we can sit here today as experts in the field and panelists but we have to have members of the populations that we are trying to serve in the conversation we cannot be planning for the people that are suffering the most and not have their voice at the table and so i think that's a really important component that we can't think the way we've always thought. And technology provides great options. And while, yes, there is some downfall to how much technology has been used, we have to also think about how it can benefit us. But you know, we, we did a, a movie for the Latino Outreach and Education in our parking lot of our building last year. It was an outside you know, evening film just to bring people out. We had 750 people come to pick up food, to pick up backpacks, social services brought Kleenex. Thinking about the simple things that people need and just starting to do that outreach differently so that we are making those connections. You know, Patty said something about us being um, human beings that need connection. We are hardwired for connection. And if we can build those trust, trust is built in really small moments. It's the moment where somebody could go pick up a box of Kleenex at an event that leads somebody to come back and say, hey, I need this too. And if we are not creating those really granular and just homegrown opportunities for the community to come together, then we miss the mark. You know, one of the other things that, um that we did along those lines were um, we had always had a food pantry and people could come and we would give them food. It um, became a burden kind of to a certain extent that we were having food besides the fact that we would get those from, um, from communities that would do outreach and would collect the food. And so then they started collecting gift cards. So now we don't have this food pantry, we give gift cards and gosh, that allows people to go buy the food that they want. I mean, imagine that. It's just yeah. the smallest thing. And I think that's the other thing I'm gonna hop off of what's, we sometimes make it so freaking complicated to change something. And so holding ourselves accountable as the people that are working together, we don't need a 10 person committee to decide that food cards are the best way to do things. And so holding ourselves accountable in a meeting to saying, what's the so what of why we're here? And what's the quickest and most effective way for us to make a change versus having 17 committee meetings where everybody's got a vote and everybody's got an opinion? Can I piggyback on the, the idea of, of sort of bringing in families in this? I wanted to, to talk about that from the idea of like workforce gaps. I mean, we all know there's workforce shortages, we're all struggling, but there is a whole informal network and an informal workforce that I think we really need to support and promote. And that's this like family navigator, like person navigator. It's a better pathway to connection. It's a better pathway to get information out there. And it's a place where we really need to build on that. Um, 
I'd love to see the opportunity of using that for, you know, it was mentioned, the sort of three ages that are at highest risk out of this, the kids that really didn't have school and are now coming in and having to do that, those we missed middle school and now we're transitioning into high school. And I'm going to add to that the, the, the oldest group. And those are the ones who missed their prom, who missed their graduation, are now, you know, the, the opening remarks was talking about the, the reduction in enrollment at the community colleges. That's the group I'd love to target and say, how can we help you find something to do? And oh, by the way, here's this job where we really need you. Um, and, and bring those two points together. And so I'll, I'll make my comments brief. Um, so my name tag here says solutions in your community. And that's actually no longer the slogan of <laughs> the University of Maryland. But I, I kept the old name tag because I loved it. Um, and so in terms of addressing gaps to the original question, um, I would say call your extension office, you know, wherever you live. There's one everywhere in the state, um, including Queen Anne's. Um, one of my colleagues who works in the Queen Anne's office is right here. So um, we have all kinds of those programs that are for that gap. You know, if any of you grew up in 4-H, that's a program that you know, is not only enriching, but you know, it, it teaches a lot of the life skills and certain things that um, you know, maybe they're not getting elsewhere or maybe they haven't had the chance to get because other services have been so reduced. So there are existing solutions in the community um, and definite plug for 4-H, definite plug for my program area, the family and consumer sciences, you know, the former home economics type of things, nutrition, finance. So these are the things that you know, people are having to uh, do a lot more on their own or, or, or ta uh, people are having to do like for example nutrition you know during the pandemic people had to cook a lot more on their own they weren't going out to the restaurants so you know there's a gap there that if people were relying on you know driving through you know the the fast food for their food and they're not doing that because there's no workers there they need to know how to prepare their own nutritious meals and so that's where extension comes in we have nutrition classes you know on the healthcare side of things um, you know, people are having to navigate health care in a variety of new ways. Um, and we have a whole health insurance literacy team. So to bridge that gap of you're having to take advantage of these, these complex systems now, how do you actually do that? So we can help people with that. Um, so call your extension office and ask, ask mm -hmm. some of these questions. If we don't, if we don't have the answer, we're going to find it for you. We will go ahead and excuse our um, panelists. You guys can take your seats. If you'll give them a round of applause.